Hello and welcome to the Female Athlete Project's International Women's Day panel presented by ECHO and Workplace Law. I'd like to start by acknowledging that I'm hosting this panel today on Wanarua land. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you are all joining us from today and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today as well. My name is Chloe Dalton and if you're new to the TFAP community, a little bit of an introduction. I'm a uh, an Olympic gold medalist in Rugby Sevens and I currently play AFLW for the GWS Giants. In one of the COVID lockdowns during 2020, I decided, decided to start the Female Athlete Project because I got really, really sick of not being able to read stories about women's sport in the newspaper or watch them on TV or hear about them on the radio. So I wanted to create this space where we could share the stories of incredible female athletes and, and be able to celebrate their achievements on a daily basis. It's been one of the most incredible journeys. We've grown our social community to over 50,000 people. We release a weekly podcast, email, we do merchandise. We now get to do live events like this, which is super exciting. And um, I just wanted to say thank you so much for jumping online today and, and to our incredible team behind the scenes who allow us to bring events like this to the people. It's really, really cool. For this panel, I'm branching out of my comfort zone a little bit. I usually only interview athletes and talk about winning and all those kind of things, but we wanted to mix it up um, and, and bring on some diverse voices from different industries and different walks of life and different experiences so that we can all come together on a day like this and learn. Um, it's, it's a pretty cool opportunity. I'm looking forward to introducing you to our panellists in a, in a second. But in terms of housekeeping, you might be able to see on the right-hand side, there's a chat box. So please feel free to join in that discussion at any point. If you've got a specific question for one of our panellists, please put it in there. We'll save about 10 minutes at the end of the panel uh, for a bit of a chat. Um, I've seen lots of discussions, particularly this year around International Women's Day, about big corporate breakfasts that often cost $200 a head. And, and there's some real barriers a lot of the time for um, people accessing events around International Women's Day. So we wanted to make this a virtual event so that people could hopefully jump online wherever they're at. We're also going to release it as a podcast if people can't get on live at the moment. And I just wanted to say a massive thank you to our partners, Echo and Workplace Law, for allowing us to put on this event that's actually free for people to get on board because we really wanted to remove that barrier for access for a lot of people. So it's really, really cool to be able to do that with our partners. I'm now going to introduce you to our incredible panellists. <coughs> So first up, we've got Vanessa Turnbull Roberts. So Vanessa is a proud Bundjalung Widjibal liable woman who is a human rights advocate, author, writer, and has acquired a law and social work degree whilst completing her first class honor thesis at the University of New South Wales. She's also a recipient of the Human Rights Medal awarded by the Australian Human Rights Commission in 2019, where her acceptance speech gained global recognition and response. Welcome, Vanessa. Next up, we've got Hannah Ferguson. So Hannah is the founder and chief executive officer of Cheek Media Co., an independent news commentary platform providing informed, progressive opinions on subjects that sit at the intersection of feminist, social and political issues. Hannah has a Bachelor of Laws, Honours and a Master of Publishing, Editing and Writing from the University of Queensland. You all need to make sure you're following Cheek Media Co. after this if you're not already. Hello and welcome, Hannah. <laughs> And finally, the incredible Sarah Naguama. So Sarah is currently over in New Zealand, uh, but she's an Australian rugby union representative who recently competed for the Wallaroos at the Rugby World Cup in New Zealand. Armed with a first-hand knowledge of rugby union and rugby league and a willingness to explore new challenges, Sarah has proven to be an insightful and articulate commentator. A growing and evident skill behind the microphone has seen her become a sought-after host, MC, and pundit on radio and television television sorry she is an absolute powerhouse so welcome to our three panelists thanks Clara. thank you excited thank to you. have you on board we're going to kick things off um hannah i might start with you can you tell us what does equity mean to you i think from my perspective the most important thing um in differentiating between equality and equity is that especially on days like today when it's all about this idea of gender equality and how we sort of progress the plight of women is that we're not one homogenous group and we're not one monolithic thing and i think that Equity really brings forward this idea that different groups experience different marginalizations and those overlapping intersections of people's identity 
can increase the barriers they face, can increase um, the amount of discrimination or prejudice they face in everyday life. And so I think that equity really strikes at the heart of ensuring that people have different things and the needs are met in different ways and that women aren't just this one group that need equality and that we need to go further than mm. the plight of white women. And I think that equity has a better focus on that than the idea of equality. So from my perspective, it's about saying, you know, I think a lot of, especially on days like today, a lot of white women tend to see it as, you know, we're just celebrating women holistically. And I think that doesn't go far enough. And I think equity really represents that one step further. Do you have an early memory um, for you personally when you realised that that life wasn't equitable? I think um, when I was, I was thinking about this question and not necessarily early, but one thing that really sort of changed my life was when I was studying law, I did a pro bono semester of volunteering um, for a legal service, a community legal centre that actually just gave advice to prisoners. And I would go out to correctional facilities um, and help prisoners, um, it, people who are experiencing incarceration with their parole applications. And a lot of the time people were still incarcerated, not because they needed to be and they could have applied for parole, but because they couldn't read and write and didn't have access to the documentation they needed to leave prison. And that was just so... Mm -hmm overwhelming for me and so confronting to realise that I this person could be actually getting their needs met and living on the outside world and not behind bars, but they were literally being prevented by the system that had failed them time and time again and that meant that they were imprisoned. Mm -hmm. And I think that at that point it was something where I realised that that experience was only based on the fact that that person had an inequitable experience in their life and they were never taught to read and write and those, those sort of the in increase in detriment and the continued failure of the system meant that they didn't have an equitable experience to even other prisoners, let alone uh, everyday civilians. And so that was kind of the moment for me when I realised, like, I need to do something about this. Yeah, absolutely. Vanessa, we might go to you next. What does equity mean to you? Thanks so much, Chloe. Um, first off, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, which we meet on this virtual meeting here today. I'm currently sitting on the lands of the Bidjigal people. Um, Bidjigal lands has been a part of my home and connection to country um, for a very long time. Um, and as a proud Bundjalung, Widjigal Waiba woman, um, I have a responsibility to acknowledge the land that gives me the privilege to do things like this. So um, thank you, Bidjigal people and the lands that we meet on. And I acknowledge all the lands and viewers of where you are today. Jingiwala, um, which is hello in my language. Um, from Bundjalung, Wichibal Waiable Nation. Um, reflecting on what does equity mean to me, um, I guess I'll, I'll share from lived experience and, and my own personal journey. Uh, I grew up in a community where we were extremely disproportionately impacted by the legal system and family policing system. And as a result of that consistent uh, legal intervention on our communities, police brutality and racism, um, what we start to see is we see the way different implications of the law and the way that pushes people back. Um, in my story, in my, my circumstance as a survivor of out-of-home care and being removed at 10 and a half years of age, um, for me going through that journey, I had to fight extra hard just to get a seat at the table. And then when I had that seat at the table, I had to fight to at least get my voice heard. So I guess when we reflect on what does equity mean, for me it's actually about giving people the complete opportunity to be at the same playing field as someone who was born into that privilege. Um, similar to what Hannah just shared so powerfully when it comes to those that are incarcerated and those that are marginalised, we need to seriously as a nation start reflecting on well, what leads somebody to incarceration and what leads somebody through the structural violence that we encounter that puts a person in that position. And we just have to take a moment to look at the history of this nation and colonisation and realise we have a history of enslavement in this country and now we have a contemporary process of that where we continue to enslave people through incarceration. And then we start to see the ripple implications of those inequities impact our communities. So for me, when we're addressing um, the inequities that exist, it's about really putting all of our minds together, not just in theory, but in action in supporting those that are marginalised and oppressed. Yeah, incredible. We're going to get to the way that you have equipped yourself as a, as a lawyer and a writer and an advocate in a little bit. But I want to go over to you, Sezi, uh, over in New Zealand in Aotearoa. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what equity means to you? Yeah, it's um, thank you both Hannah and Vanessa for sharing so beautifully and powerfully. Those those um, meanings certainly resonate with me. But equity, I think looking at the context of sport where I feel it the most is about ensuring that everyone has 
it's the same opportunity to achieve a common goal. And, you know, I think it, it really is a bit of a pain point often when we are, <clears throat> so Wallaroos, we're currently a seven professional um I guess, environment and being held to professional standards, yet not the same kind of opportunity provided to us. And the truth of the, the matter is, as a semi-pro, we're trying to find times outside in our day-to-day to, to get all the training and the strength and conditioning that we need outside of the two or three hours that we have. But it doesn't necessarily um, serve everyone because girls have to be up at the you know up in the morning, six o'clock, go to train. No one's complaining about that, but there isn't many options throughout the day if they can't make a certain slot. And it's really hard, and I, I feel like it's a constant tug of war in the sport, trying to prove our worth, trying to prove that we deserve more, we need more, um, because we you know have often been told we should just be grateful because the game has progressed so far but we're now in this place where um you know you currently look at the world and you currently look at the world and essentially we're the two national teams of australia yet the opportunities and the resources and the services that they're provided don't necessarily match what the world are being given yet the expectation is that we are still professional and we hold ourselves accountable but it's really hard when girls have to battle that with all of their day-to-day um tug of wars of being a mother being a wife or you know just trying to earn some money because your semi-professional contract doesn't offer that to you so it's really hard because I feel like at the moment um it's either you know you've got to make these sessions because this is what's required of you but how about if you're a shift worker and you have to work in the evening does that mean you put yourself out financially so that you can be an athlete so to me equity you know specifically addresses that that um that whole realm of opportunity for me to be held accountable, to, for me to be held to the same uh, standard of a wallaby, am I being given the same resources that they're given so that they're enabled mm-hmm. to succeed in, in realm of sports? So, yeah, equity, you know, in, in mm-hmm. summary, is just having access to the same opportunity so that I can succeed just as my male counterparts can. Was there an early moment for you, says, where you noticed that difference between the two? Yeah, I think when I was... Reflecting on this question, I couldn't really specify a moment, but I think it really comes to me, it comes to light in small moments of oversight. Um, I have a, an example of um, was training at a facility. The, men's were train, the men were training, we were training. We came out and there was this table of snacks and they had some like snack, but like some protein bars some shakes and stuff. We went to go grab it and someone said to us, oh, no, you can't actually touch that. That's just for the boys. And for me, that really, that really hurt because I thought, well, my whole team is here too and we're training just as hard as them and their their goal is to win a premiership and so is ours so how is this recovery table only reserved for them when we're trying to achieve the same thing and you know that's just one moment it's also being out on the field at eight o'clock at night because you have to train after colts which is equivalent to under 20s and the lights go off because that's that's the the max period that we're allowed to be on field so for me there aren't you know, there aren't big examples, but I think there are small moments of oversight that show this indifference between men and women, um, that the same level of consideration hasn't been given. And I think that is the part that hurts most. Yeah, I think in my experience as well, there's there's definitely a lot of indirect sources of information a lot of the time that kind of just reinforce that idea that it that it's not equal, equal access and equal opportunity. Hannah, mm. back to you. Um, can you talk to us about how you started Cheek, I know it was, it was co-founded with a few of you, but how, how this idea came about and what was it for you that made you so passionate about being a voice in this space? Um, I think it also comes back to like when I first started, when I was first in university, 18 studying law, I was sort of looking around. I'd come from a rural town in South Wales um, and I, you know, wasn't really wasn't really part of the, the environment that law school was. And when I got there and I realised that all of these kids had gone to private elite institutions um, and they were all you know, upper class white kids and you know I'm a very privileged white woman but I was I couldn't make a friend I, I cannot even express how tough I found the culture because it was so elitist and it was so exclusive and everyone was obsessed with over complexifying every topic every every piece of language had to be how do I make myself sound smart and not how do I communicate well and I thought that in the political sphere, um, in media and in the law, it made me really consider who makes up these institutions and who is sitting in positions of power that make decisions that affect everyone. Mm-hmm. And I think that especially through law and politics, it's really so much of the same sort of person. And it is these people that have gone to these private institutions and been very privileged. And then they're the ones who rise to positions of power and make decisions that affect all of us. And I think that it was at this time when I realised that a lot of people were using a lot of nine letter words in a sentence but had no idea what they were talking about. And I sort of sat around and was mm. like, 
how do we stop this? How do we ensure that people can read an article from an, in a newspaper and understand what it means and not feel put off or held at arm's length because the language is trying to be confusing and is driving an agenda? And so for me, founding Cheek, it was about, I think it was something that my younger self needed. And I think it's something that was aimed to rebalance those scales and say, we are all a part of this conversation and we are all welcome to an opinion and the way that we articulate doesn't have to sort of negate the fact that we have something important to say um, and so for me it was about simplifying making news politics um, and and legal ideas and arguments um, accessible for everyone but also entertaining how do we make the news something that doesn't exhaust and terrify us and so that was kind of my drive always was to make sure that everyone could access the information in the same way and take something from it and sort of reflect and educate themselves. I've absolutely loved seeing the way that your page has grown. I feel like a proud mum when I jump on board for the ride. <laughs> what has that experience <laughs> been like for you in, in terms of the way that simplifying it and making it engaging and making it easy to access has been like in, in terms of the way that that's been received? Um, it's really validating. It's funny because I think that, you know, when you start something, you never expect it to be the thing it's going to be. And it's really changed, especially since the federal election. What was really hard was it was really growing when things go bad. And that's a really hard thing to face as someone trying to run a platform is Scott Morrison's success is my success too, because people just love to come in and that content was so easy, right? And now it's harder because people are less willing to critique a progressive in inverted quotations, heavily government. Um, and I think it's about saying we need, to, it's about moving people. And I think that people are drawn to feeling like their opinions are being heard and seen, but it's also that I want people to be attracted to the page because they feel represented, but I also really want to challenge those held assumptions and say, it's not about shaming your perspective. It's about asking why you think the way you do and how you've gotten here. And it's been so exciting to mm -hmm. see the momentum and that it's, it's so reaffirming and it, I feel like I know I'm on the right path. Um, and it's growing every day, but it's also like part of it is like, you know, sometimes people aren't taking to the serious content and they're there for the jokes. And I'm like, can we have both, please? That's really important too. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that balance, even for us at the Female Athlete Project, it's that balance where so much of what we do, we want to be celebrating and calling out the positive things. But what you were touching on, we also notice a lot of growth when it's negative people sharing it because they want to use their platform and their voice to call things out. And I think pages like yours really empower people to kind of use their voice however big their platform is so I think that's really cool Vanessa coming back to you how did you how did you find through your experience and and you talked about being a survivor of out-of-home care how did you then transition that into knowing that you wanted to to use your voice to create change and work out that it was through becoming a lawyer that that might be the best way to do that Thanks, Chloe. And can I just say, Cheeky Media is probably the one of only pages that I can actually understand, even with a legal background. Sometimes I see like ABs, like I shouldn't, sometimes I see other news outlets putting things up on social media and I'm like, what happened? And I've got to go safari, search that search, but then I can just jump on Cheeky Media and, and things make sense. So thank you, sis, for making things make a bit more sense for us. <laughs> um, we're very lucky. Um, yeah, Chloe, I think just being able to, to find my voice is because my voice was so taken away um, in a in a system that's built to ultimately protect children and intervene when there's neglect or forms of uh, physical, emotional or sexual abuse. Um, in my circumstance of, of my removal, I was taken for reasons of racially charged racism, um, policies that we see historically written but continue today. And so I reflect often on that night that I was removed at 10 and a half years old and I was thrown into the back of a docs worker's car. Um, docs is what we used to call welfare. It's now known as the Department of Communities and Justice. And so for me, that moment that I was thrown into the back of that car with all the police officers and the docs worker at that time um, was a moment that I, I come from a community where our voices are always heard. Our children, our jarjums, which means children in my language, are the pillars of our future. They are our generation, they are our strengths, they are our ancestors and our warriors. Our children will be sitting at the table having conversations with adults. Our children will be able to always have a voice at the table. And so that moment at 10 and a half years old when I was put in that car um, was a moment where I felt my whole body and my whole spirit be completely silenced. And when you grow up in community where you recognise that there's a disproportionate impact of the legal system and you come from a family where 
you always have a say at the table, but then you're taken into a system where you're completely voiceless and silenced, you start to grow this sense of strength in the midst of that survival. And that's what you will often hear from survivors of different experiences within their world is that whilst there's all this pain and this pain that runs deep, there is equally this significant strength that is building. And I believe that that system was not ready for me to come up with my strength. And I believe that system wasn't ready for a young, proud, bungee language wire woman to say, I'm actually going to undertake law. I'm going to learn your system better than you know your system. And then you know what? When I survive and I find my freedom, my duty within that freedom is also to free other children and young people. And so for me, having that voice is actually about not being necessarily that voice for that child and young person, but creating that space and sense of accountability for the system that still continue to silence children and young people. Doing law and social work was just one avenue to actually not give them a choice, but to listen and say, I have your credibility plus more, but now I have my survival. And now I'm not giving you a choice, but to listen because it's First Nations lives, which hold a disproportionate impact of child removal here in this nation who were impacted the most. And we are already marginalised when it comes to looking at the history of inequities in this nation. And so we have a responsibility um, to open up that conversation and, and, and create better change for our children and young people. Yeah, it's really, it's powerful. And, and I have the opportunity to know you personally and, and that strength and power comes out in, in every day that you live your life. So, um, yeah, it's, it's just incredible what you've done so far, Nessa. And I, I look forward to continue to seeing uh, the impact that you make. Says you recently became the first Fijian to commentate on the World Rugby Seven series. How does that sit with you? Because for people who don't um, know a lot about rugby sevens, Fijians are a powerhouse in the sport. They are they are so good to watch. They're so exciting to watch. How does that sit with you when it's this incredible milestone? But at the same time, you shouldn't have been the first to do it in 2023. Yeah. Firstly, Vanessa, I have goosebumps every time I hear your voice. I just, I'm just so enthralled by what you have to say. Um, Chloe, going back to your question, it was a huge milestone, and I genuinely didn't know that I was the first Fijian commentator to do so. And that whole conversation or that whole comment came to light um, at the at the Sydney Sevens. Um, it was the day before the Sydney Sevens were set to launch, and we went in for a broadcast meeting and. Uh, the senior producer came up to me and he was like really excited to meet me and I was obviously very excited to meet him too to be entrusted to be able to commentate some of the best athletes in the world and he he said to me you know Fijians have contributed so much to the sport of rugby union yet you are the first woman either male or female to commentate on this circuit that moment I think will live in my mind forever rent free and there's this quote that I've read and I always hold it close to my heart is that I am my ancestors while the streams I think about the story of my bumbu which is grandma in Fiji and um, my bumbu and my papa coming over here, sending my parents over or my dad over and what life they would have envisioned for him, which necessarily didn't come to pass because of like choices he made, but now I get to live out this life that they intended for him. And um, it's crazy to think that I am the first to do it, but now that I'm a first, that means that there's so much space, there were this space, there's opportunity, there's actually belief that more of us can be in this space. And um, you know, I think as a, as a Pacific Islander, as well as a Melanesian woman, I think that there are often these stereotypes that society hold us to, that we are good for the field, but not behind a mic, that we're quite timid people or not very intelligent. But like I am living and proving proof that we are so much more than that. And, you know, with um, with holding space like this comes responsibility to, to continually raise awareness um, about the fact that there is so much more that Fijian people can offer. And there are so many clever, articulate people that can do this. And... Um, I think for me, it's just, it's crazy to think that I'm the first, like I, I often look at my reflection in the mirror and being like, I'm just, I'm Sarah, I grew up in Bexley, like, you know, I, I don't have a degree, but yet I'm given these opportunities um, to do some really cool stuff with my life. And, you know, all I can hope that does is just for the young Fijian girls or young Fijian boys or any anyone that can resonate with my identity and my appearance, um, that they also know that they are worthy and that they are so capable of being in this space. And I didn't grow up having a Fijian commentator in front of me that I thought I wanted to be like, but the fact that now I have the opportunity to potentially be that for someone else um, means so much to me. So um, I'm looking forward to the day that I get to have another Fijian in the booth. But, you know, one cool moment I do want to call upon is when, when, when I was in the box, <clears throat> I was looking around the room and it was Ken Laban, who was of Samoan descent. There was Carl Tanano, who was an iconic all black legend. Um, and there was also Honey Hidden Me, a Maori woman. And I just thought there are so there are brown people in this box. And the truth of the matter is, 
we can totally hold our own. Um, and that was just yeah. a really cool moment to think about this moment that I'm in, I want to embrace it and I want to acknowledge it, but I also want to aspire to see so many more in that box. And yeah, it was really special. I have goosebumps talking about it because I just never thought it'd be something that I'd be able to do, but bloody hell, I'm really proud that I got to do it. Yeah. Yeah. You absolutely should be. And you've just, you've stepped into that space, as you said, with, with intelligence, you're articulate and you are, to me, you were just charisma personified. So I love seeing you flourish in that space. Vanessa, we've got a question from one of our sponsors at Echo and we wanted to ask, why is it important to promote diverse workplaces and how does this contribute to the well-being of the employees and, and the overall success of the business? Thanks so much. Um, and thanks, Echo, for that, that question. Um, I think, you know, we have a prime, prime example that we just heard from Sarah where she's now been provided the opportunity to be a representation within the... Uh, commentating, reporting space of um, professional sport. And not only has that liberated the viewers that just got to hear it, but it's liberated a whole generation of Fijian and black and brown bodies that get to grow up and actually be like, you know what, if I want to be there, I have an opportunity to be there and I get to listen to Sarah because Sarah's there. And if I have a goal to get there, I'm going to get there, which is so empowering. Um, I think when we're looking at workplace and we're looking at, all the different forms of workplace, um, we need to also acknowledge that sport isn't exempt to being a workplace. Um, I have many family members who have grown up in this sporting professional world. I have a partner who was previously an ex-professional um, athlete, now retired. Um, my uncle Frank Roberts was the first ever Indigenous boxer to go over and represent Australia at the Olympics. My pop was a professional boxer where he had to ask the White Protection Board for permission to go and fight. Um, and so sporting has always been around my family and community as well. Um, but just acknowledging the definition of workplace, the sporting world is a workplace. And um, when we choose to recognise the importance of diversity and inclusion, we're saying as a workplace that we're taking a step to be anti-racist and we're taking steps to actually demonstrate that there is power and strength in providing those opportunities to diverse and marginalised people. Because we need to recognise that many of the employees that we may have in this position right now, whether they're professional athletes or whether they're lawyers or whether they're you know, working at the local cafe, that they were placed in privileged positions to get there in the first place, whereas there are people that haven't been provided with that opportunity. And so when you strengthen... Uh, whether it's First Nations people, whether it's uh, black and brown, uh, other people of colour from around the world into the workplace, you're inviting a whole form of strength that comes with that individual and person. And the work will always end up being great because not only are you going to get that specific job done, but you're going to create a space of liberation within your workplace because that's what comes with Indigenous people around the world is that we don't just come to a workplace and have one goal, get it done. We come with a whole wealth of knowledge and strength, resilience and love. And that echoes throughout our workplace. Um, you'll probably find um, within your team, when there's First Nations people within the team, other Indigenous people around the world, that there is a sense of community and love and there's a deeper sense of strength in the team because those values are what we come from as Indigenous people and that gets to be brought into the workplace. And so the, work, the employees benefit um, the clients benefit on the outside and we just create a more a more just place for diversity and representation within the space. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Nessa. I wanted to jump over next to Hannah. One of the big things that I've noticed in the way that you communicate a lot of the time, you're, you're really big on honesty and transparency and, and vulnerability through your platform. What role do you think these play in the push for equity? I think that especially in the media landscape, there is this real um, opposition to admitting prejudice and an inability to, to place blame where it should be placed. And I think that our headlines do that. I think that commentators do that. And I think that often the people that are holding discomfort are the people that are victims, survivors, complainants. And instead we need to learn how to shift blame and discomfort and shame to the people that it should light the feet of. Um, and I think that our headlines really fail on that front and it's not an accident, it's an agenda. And I think that's so important because these people know how language works and they know how important transparency and prejudice and bias is and they choose, again, to consistently wrong the people that are seeking help. And I think that in terms of what I'm trying to do with Cheek, it's be honest about when I screw up 
because I think that media so often is just desperate to conceal and obscure the truth in those in those ways. And I think that often it is so much more it's it's it it says so much more about us the way we respond to failure or getting it wrong than when we get it right. And for me, I think we have also major problems in this country with our inability to converse about issues specifically related to race and disability. And I think it's about recognizing and reflecting and remaining aware of privilege and how that impacts your view of the world. And I'm not always going to be able to write from lived experience and I can't claim to. And I think it's about being honest and vulnerable and passing the mic and working out how to center someone else in in real ways not performed. And I think it's about sitting with the discomfort. And there's a huge difference between someone like Alan Jones who positions hate and bigotry as an opinion piece and someone who maybe just is not informed and not educated and I'm trying to speak to those people and say I have the privilege to have this conversation and and do this work and I would like to and that's not to say that we should engage it with you know the harmful parts and corners of society that are unwilling to have the conversation but for me I think in terms of equity it's how do I use this platform I've built to remain honest and transparent and empower people to go and educate themselves so that they can do better in their own lives and make sure that they are understanding their privileges and how how we work towards a more equitable society. We've had a comment just while you were talking from Kylie saying headlines are disgraceful, especially when it's about violence against women. Cheek and Tarang Chawla are great, are great at calling it out. So Tarang is uh, another incredible example for people that don't follow him um, who actually lost uh, his sister through domestic violence and... Um, he, he does a really similar role to what you're talking about there, Hannah, in, in calling out the language that often surrounds incidents like that. Um, we're going to head over to Sarah for another question. But in the meantime, again, anyone in the audience, we're, we're going to open up a little bit of time. We've got just about nine minutes remaining. So if you do have a question for any of the panellists, please pop it in there. But we'll, we'll keep um, going along because I'm loving, loving what we've got going on here with these panellists. Um, so it says, back to you, we've got another sponsor question from our sponsor, Workplace Law. Who are some women in leadership roles in your life that you look up to and what have you learned from these women? Wow, this question made me think about a lot of incredible women I have in my life and truth is there are so many role models and I want to kind of steer away from, like, absolutely I acknowledge my mother and my grandmother because I know if not for them I would not be who I am or even here today. So mum and boom boom, love you, acknowledge you. Yeah. Um, but looking at women... <laughs> <laughs> they'll, they'll, pull, they'll pull me out if they'll pop out if I don't acknowledge them. <laughs> Making sure I'm doing the part here. Um, but one, there, there are two women in particular that um, come to mind, and the first is Arietta Rika. She is a cousin-in-law of mine, but I want to get this right because I wrote her title down, but she's the manager um, of governance and communication at the New South Wales Department of Education. But before she was that, she actually was a founder, was the founder of a, um, a well-known a blog platform called Talanoa, and it was the first time for me to see um, a woman of, of Pacific descent create this platform where she was sharing stories about our people, our success stories, and it wasn't just about the, you know, the incredibly talented athletes, but it was about the creator, it was about the writer, it was about the hairdresser, and just kind of spotlighting all the different kinds of women that we had in our community and celebrating them when truth of the matter is there would have, no one had really taken the time to share their stories or share their light and their brilliant everyday women and for me that was really inspiring and really sparked my interest um, in storytelling both hearing it and being able to tell it so Arietta Rika she really sticks out to me and um, she is just someone that's so so incredible so grounded um, and so in touch has a finger on the pulse when it comes to our community and that's something that I deeply admire Um, and another and and I know Chloe you know her but it's Erin Morton we call her Bezzy she is the team manager of the New South Wales Waratahs she's deeply entrenched when it comes to grassroots oh I get a bit emotional I've got goosebumps because I know she's probably watching this somewhere probably from her office Um, but to me um, there are so many so many things that happen um, in sports where you, you, you want to rock up and you want to do your part and you're, you're carrying the load of your day when you walk into training at five o'clock in the afternoon. Yet Bez is someone who, when you walk in, she makes you feel like you're valued and that you're, um, I feel like she's the person that goes to war for us and she has the hard conversations and she calls stuff out when it's not right, making sure that us girls get the same treatment as the men. And I think it's um it's really the the way that the sport rugby union has evolved hasn't just happened it's because of people like Bez who really hold people accountable who 
push your case in the private places um, and have hard conversation probably, you know, is, is not very, um, probably has made enemies along the way because she's so passionate about us. But I just know that women's rugby wouldn't be in the place that it is today. I wouldn't have the privileges that I have today if it wasn't for people like Bez and Trudy. She's just one of an army who have done so much great work so that we could be in the position that we are today. So I definitely want to acknowledge um, Arietta Rica and Erin Martin. I love that you included Bez in a shout out there. So for people who don't know, she co-hosts our weekly podcast through TFAP. It's called The Wrap. She also does all of the research when I interview athletes. She's the one who does a lot behind the scenes. If you've ever bought any TFAP merch, she's probably packed it up from um, her and her partner Cookie's spare bedroom, shipped it out to you. So she does a huge amount of work as well as a lot of our other incredible members of our TFAP team. So a big shout out to Bez and thank you for, for pointing that one out as well, Ceci. Um I wanted to ask, we might we might go to you, Nessa. What does an equitable future look like to you? And can you maybe give us one practical thing that people listening today can can implement in the, their lives? Thanks, Chloe. And um, just carrying off the Bez shout outs. Um, I'm not I'm not really involved in in the sporting world of such, but. Um, as I mentioned, my, my partner is, and, and that was a little bit of an introduction to the football world that I got. And um, all I can say is Bez's name is thrown around with so much love and justice. So if no one knows Bez, um, look up Bez, Erin uh, Morton, but known as Bez, uh, an incredible person that um, we all get to know and love. Um, the Bez shout out. It should be Bez, Bez's morning chat. <laughs> <laughs> um, what does an equitable future look like? Um, for me, it's freedom. Hey, like I always go back to that, and it's 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 seeing freedom for our children, young people, particularly subjected to the family policing system, which is what I went through, um, and also looking at the disproportionate rates of incarceration um, that we have with children, young people who are incarcerated, um, particularly the pipeline where people go from the family policing system, such as removal from their families and communities. Um, to then the high rates of incarceration. Um, so for me, it would be closing those cages, uh, particularly for our children and young people, and practically putting in early intervention and prevention support for families and communities. We, we live in a society where we believe that punishment um, is a better solution as, a, as opposed to appropriate support and intervention means. Um, People do often ask me, what can I do to actually contribute to this cause or what can I do to get better involved and, and, and play my part? Um, for me, it's a, it's, it's a couple of things. It, it's, it's a listening and amplifying the voices of those with lived experience and those that have been through this process. Um, and it's really, really doing that deep listening. Um, two, it, it, it's, it's showing up. You'll find a lot of survivors um, are often the ones that are doing a lot of the groundwork and working with different community organisations, government, non-government spaces to say, we need to do this. But in order to do that, we need um, uh, the nation, Indigenous and non-Indigenous people together to say, actually, I'm, I'm going to show up for this because it's an important cause and because that's a responsibility I have um, to support this, this process, to support these individuals and people. Um, and the third one is recognize that the the traditional country that you're on so whether you're situated on Bidjigal country uh gadigal uh Gamaregal, Dangari, wherever you are around this beautiful sacred land recognize that within that land that there's a story and with that story probably comes an injustice somewhere along the line whether it's incarceration or family policing but reflect on that country that you're on and think about practically, how can I reach out to a local organisation that is actually doing the fundamental work to support children and young people or Indigenous people overall when it comes to what we are subjected to? So that can be, I'm actually going to commit by paying the rent and providing a particular donation to this organisation so that they can be sustainable and be able to do the fundamental groundwork that we know um, our, our policies and um, our state system is not doing. And it's actually about that advocacy. So saying, I'm going to stand with this organisation because I live on this country, I benefit off this country, I am on stolen land and I have a responsibility to support and give back. So I'm going to stand with this organisation and when they pull out a calling of love and justice to stand in advocacy, then I'm, I'm going to stand with this organisation. Because the only justice that we ever get, um, Chloe and, and, and sisters here today and brothers, is the justice we demand. And that's what history has told us and that's what the future will tell us. 
Um, we have too many of our children and young people incarcerated. And when our children and young people go through that system, they miss out on opportunities like fair and just workplaces. They miss out on opportunities like becoming professional athletes. They miss out on ever having their foot in the door. And the results that we see are high rates of suicide, deaths in custody, this break, uh, breakdown of families and communities. Um, and there's there's so much more we can do to create a better future. Um, and all of my work and my book coming out is all centered around reimagining that better future. Um, so I, I seriously invite everybody to, to really come on board, reflect on your country that you're on, where you benefit, live, work, play, whatever you do, and think about giving back to that organization um, and doing that with integrity and love. So, you know, it doesn't have to be publicized that you're doing it, but remembering actually I'm playing my role because everyone has a role to play in creating a better future. Yeah, I love that. I think it's so helpful to have um, such a practical way to to make an impact. So thank you, Nessa, so much for sharing that. Um, apologies to Loz, who's, who's popped a question there. We've, we've run out of time to answer that one, but I just wanted to do a final, each of the panellists, we'll start with you, Hannah, just a 10 second little um, self plug for where people can find you, any little projects you want to give a quick shout out to before we wrap up. Um, the main one would be on Instagram at cheekmedia.co, uh, otherwise on our website cheekmedia.com.au and we have three podcasts on Apple and Spotify that will be found under Cheek as well. Um, and I've got a book coming out in October. That's a while away, but, you know, put it on the list somewhere. <laughs> I love it. Love it. Um, over to you, Sezi. Yes, yeah, so you can find me on Instagram. My handle is at Sarah Nangama. My name is also there, I think, by my picture, so just find it. And my name is spelled differently. It's S-E-R-A. I'm different. Fijian. You'll, you'll find me. <laughs> <laughs> love it and Vanessa um probably similar social media um Instagram Nessa Turnbull Roberts Twitter Turnbull Vanessa um and similar to um sister Hannah here my book's uh, due to come out next year but I've got to get this manuscript done by October so we just got to do a bit of a bit of the end the middle and the beginning and we should be done <laughs> so <watch out. laughs> it's hard work um I just <laughs> wanted to say a huge thank you to the three of you in particular. I, my heart feels so full having the opportunity to, to have you on this platform to share your incredible stories. You're such strong, powerful woman, women who are pa paving the way for um, so many who will come after you. And it, it's a real honour to have had your voices and, and your experience with us today. So thank you so much. Thank you so much to everyone who's tuned in live. Thank you so much to our partners, Echo and Workplace Law, and to my incredible team at TFAP who brought this all together. Um, I've absolutely loved it. I hope you guys got something out of it. And, yeah, thank you again to, um, to my three panellists. I really, really appreciate your time and your stories. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Flo. Thanks so much. <laughs> and don't forget, you can follow us on Instagram at The Female Athlete Project. <laughs>